very much. And um, I think that was a great discussion and debate to lead on to my discussion. And if I can put my microphone on. <coughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this talk. Now, first of all, I want to uh, say that I don't claim to be an expert in long-term care. And also, if you would look at the title of this talk in your program or on here, I actually do not title it as long-term care. I title it as the healthcare system more broadly. And I hope that towards the end, you might understand why I do it this way. So this talk is a little bit challenging in the following senses. Even if I talk to my colleagues in healthcare, in healthcare system, we actually don't, do not necessarily have a common definition or, un, or understanding of what do we mean by healthcare system. So today in this audience, there are even more people who don't work in healthcare system. So to avoid any more confusion, I will start with a little definition at least for the next half hour that we'll be using. And the next challenge is, well, the organizers said talk about Asia. Well, I understand that looking at your program, there has been focus on EP, EAP, NEA, EA, Southeast, so whatever. So Asia is very big. Asia is very heterogeneous in terms of income, in terms of demographic, in terms of social and cultural structure, and in terms of healthcare system. So uh, my talk is necessarily going to be a little bit broad rather than going to specific. The third challenge is, as a partner has already alluded to, perhaps except for Korea and Japan that have done something to its healthcare system to um, to, to respond to aging in a more substantive way, I would say most other countries are still at the stage of being aware there is a problem and want to prepare for it. So there's not a lot of empirical evidence that I can cite to you to say this is the model that works and this is the model that doesn't work. So this is a little bit more of a conceptual understanding, but I hope there is enough material here to kick off a discussion and a debate. So it's not meant to be prescriptive. Now, what do I mean by a healthcare system? Um, when I talk about healthcare system, I don't mean taking my name away. <laughs> I don't mean counting the number of beds. I don't mean counting the number of staff. I mean that a healthcare system, I conceptualize healthcare system as a means to produce some social goals. And the means that the structural elements of a healthcare system that we quite often talk about is financing and delivery. There are other aspects as well, but I'm going to mostly focus on financing and delivery. But financing for what and delivering for what is to serve some social goal. And what are these social goals? Is to make sure that everybody including the older people, would have affordable and equitable access to effective services. And I want to focus on that term, effective services, without paying major um, money out of pocket, meaning they would not be facing major financial burden. And underlying this social goal is an implicit assumption that we want a healthcare system to serve an aging population that would be maximizing the benefits to them with limited resources. So there's a strong element of how to think about organizing a healthcare system that has to be efficient and effective. And I think that should be the goal to guide us on thinking about the healthcare system rather than to argue about how much more money do we want to put into the system. Because the question is still putting into the system for what? So it is the for what part that we should be focusing our attention to. I'm going to give you a quick snapshot of the Asian healthcare system because what we can propose for Asia to think about to confront an aging population depends on very much where they sit now. 
you cannot create a healthcare system from scratch. So I'm going to give you a very quick snapshot of Asia's healthcare system in terms of financing and delivery, and a partner has already covered some of that. In terms of financing in Asia, many countries is still spending a relatively low amount in healthcare. So this table, this, this graph only tell you that among the different Asian countries, spending level is highly variable. But don't take too much, don't interpret too much from it. Because there are many courses for these variable spending. The next graph perhaps is more important to remember. A large number of Asian countries still have the majority of its healthcare expenditure financed by out-of-pocket payments. And this is important to bear in mind. And at the same time, in many Asian countries, government spending on health care as a share of GDP is still relatively low compared to a global average. And what is the reason? There are two broad categories of reason. One is some of the countries are still just poor or developing. Like this morning we hear about Myanmar. Countries just have competing demands, and health is only one of them. And the other reason to say the obvious is countries, low-income countries, tend to have a smaller government in terms of the total economy, the total budget that the government has in control to be able to pay for. So partly, many Asian countries are spending, the government is spending relatively low in health care, partly it's because they don't have money. But partly it's also health is not necessarily a priority yet. Now, this is important because we here sit here as a group of policy analysts and academics, we are so forward-looking and rational, we want to plan for 20 years later, but that's not how politicians plan. Aging might be something they want to talk about, but it might be a little bit far for them to want to do something in their current term of office, if they have other competing demands. And that's a very reality that we have to face with. The take-home message of these several slides is that if later on, when later on we're going to talk about how to finance for an aging population, I think you know where I'm getting at. I don't think that it will be very realistic to say that we can depend on the government to finance for them. So the question is, what is the alternative sources of financing? We know that if we want people to pay directly out of pocket, that's inequitable. That makes a lot of poor people not having access to health care. And if they have access to health care, they bear a big financial burden. So perhaps we are not only talking about how much more money we need, but also how to finance it. And there's a fundamental problem with an aging population is if you want to finance health care for the older people by contribution, contribution from the working population, is that going to be sustainable when the dependency ratio change over time with an aging population. So, just background. Delivery system. I would say that most of you who have worked in Asia, even though you are not an expert in healthcare system, you will agree that in Asia, most of the delivery is done by a mix of public and private providers. With the private providers highly variable in quality, you have some of the very best private providers in the world, but you also have a lot of quacks. And in general, the government is relatively weak and poor in regulating the private sector. The second feature of the Asian healthcare system, which might be similar to many other middle and low income countries, is it is typically a hospital based and fragmented delivery system. It is not a primary care based system, even though most policy documents are saying that you should develop a primary care based delivery system. But in practice, Asia is not there yet. The third characteristic you will see in many Asian countries is that the distribution of surface and supply is rather inequitable. 
is very urban biased, urban based, and so with the rural area and then with the poorer area having fewer supply available. So this is the starting point. So I want to just put this in your mind, what we're talking about if we say Asian healthcare system. So what additional pressure does aging put on the Asian healthcare system? Well, one is, of course, health expenditure. We just had a debate. And I would conclude by saying that, yes, aging, of course, contributes to health expenditure. The debate that we are talking about now have two points. One is it may not be as big as what we used to think compared to other things. To give you an example, WHO has an estimate to show that waste and inefficiency in healthcare system account for 30% of healthcare expenditure. I don't think aging accounts for that much. So we're talking about relative terms. Number two is We are talking about earlier health expenditure growth for the entire population. But of course, as we have aging, we have a question of how do you fund the service of the older population? Do they pay for themselves or do they have the current young cohort pay for themselves? Or should there be some kind of saving elements to save today in order to pay for future older care? So this I would leave with you to think about it. But what I'm going to argue is when we think about what is a healthcare system that should be for an aging population, we should start with what is the need of an aging population? What is the service and delivery system that is required to meet the need of that population? Then we come back to think about how do we finance for that? That should be the logical thinking. Now, a partner slide show us very clearly that an aging population, when it as it relates to health, is it has an increased burden in non-communicable diseases, chronic conditions. No one would dispute that. And what does that mean in terms of delivery? There is ample evidence to show that for chronic diseases, the most effective way of delivery is an integrated delivery system based in primary health care. In other words, there is a strong primary care system that will be responsible for prevention, health promotion, early detection, management of diseases, and referral. Because we all know that individuals are actually not capable of being an intelligent consumer of health care. We don't know how to choose. We don't know when we need what services. So we need an agent to help us. And in the world, we now have enough evidence that the primary health care providers is the best agent for an individual to do that. It's not insurance company. It's not a social insurance. It's your primary health care provider. Many Asian countries have evidence to show that when they have a poor primary health care system, what people usually do is they go directly to the hospital. Pay a lot, but not necessarily getting better care. Or they delay care because they didn't even know they have hypertension. They didn't even know that they have diabetes then when it becomes serious, they get hospitalized. And I will just give you some evidence from China, which has a very poor primary care-based delivery system and fragmented system. And this is a collection of different studies. And the studies show that in China, for patients with diabetes, and this is a collection of different studies, approximately only about 30% of them are aware they have diabetes. An illustration that there is actually very poor screening and health examination. And among of those who are aware they have diabetes, only about 26 to 30% to 30 are being treated. And among those who are treated, less than 50% have the conditions under control. Similarly, for hypertension, 
Now, these data are not for people over 65. I think they're for a variation of people over 45 and, and for different studies. But I've seen some of this uh, data from Charles. In fact, it's showing a similar um, uh, number of undiagnosis or under diagnoses or under treatment. And there's also data to show that in China, complication admission to hospital due to diabetes complication is five times as more likely as people in OECD. So these are just some of the examples to show you why a hospital-based fragmented delivery system is bad for non-communicable disease and therefore a aging population um, uh, society. I think the evidence that we're seeing actually say that a lot of old people between age 65 and 75 are relatively healthy. So it is not clear to me if you think about a healthcare system for them, to what extent it is that different from a healthcare system for a typical 50 years old. But as people age to 75, there are studies, I think this is from the US, to show that the likelihood of having three or more chronic conditions is much higher. And as you age to the 80s, you're six times more likely to have multiple functional impairments. This is the two group of people who actually require care, not just in the medical sector. They actually require care to help them with daily functioning. And that's where social care comes in. Now, there are a lot of different use of these terminologies. Maybe this is long-term care, but by social care, I mean a collection of services that would provide care for an individual to help them with the daily functioning. And it could be done by a combination of formal and informal provider. It could be your family, but it could also be formal services provided by home care, residential, long-term care, etc. In Asia, as in many other parts of the world, Quite often, social care is actually organized and funded separately from health care. Now, I may be saying something that might contradict what a partner said earlier here. It is actually not good from a service delivery perspective to have those two delivery and financing separate. That is medical and social service. Because Separate financing quite often means that the two services are not integrated. And if we're talking about serving the needs of the population, we need to think about the patient as a person. The patient doesn't know which part of the care he needs is long-term care. From your technical definition, which part of the care is health care from your technical definition? He or she and his family only wants to know what is the care that is best for him or her to stay healthy. And so some of the countries trying to respond to the need of providing old people with both medical care and also functional support and is to move towards integrated health and social care. Now, integrated health and social care, actually Albert just asked me earlier, has countries done it? Many countries in Asia have done it. I would say very limited. And so, in other words, in terms of the delivery system, adding to the integrated delivery system that I showed earlier now, is also this big cluster of social care. But this big cluster of social care also still needs to be in some way connected to the medical system rather than being a separate system. So recently, a, the King's Fund did a review of um, five models in England and also seven models in the United States, in Australia, in England, and also in different parts of Europe. And they have some preliminary conclusions. 
what is these kind of integrated health and social care system? One common point is that they often have a single point of entry. In other words, there is one single person or entity who will be coordinating things. And this is the case manager in many terminology. The case manager will be assessing the needs and then sharing the information and coordinating delivery among the multiple formal and informal providers. I'm going to skip that. How do you organize that sort of ideal, idealized, integrated health and social care? From the review of these seven countries, what is what they find is that to provide integrated service or coordinated service actually does not require integrating the organization. In fact, some of the countries that go ahead and try to integrate the organization find them spending all their time and energy to integrate the organization and dealing with bureaucratic barriers rather than integrating the care for the individual. So that's lesson number one. Lesson number two is there's really no obvious reason to choose public or private providers. Many of the successful systems are using whoever that is available that provide the best care. Now the question is then, what will incentivize them to pick the best people, to pick the best carer? The third point that they have found out is, well, in Asia, as in many areas, we call, we keep calling out and say, let's build a primary health care system and let the primary health care provider be the gatekeeper and be that case manager. Well, these seven case studies actually find that a primary health care doctor cannot play that function because he or she is too busy. You need a case manager who doesn't have to be trained in very sophisticated so we are talking about using cost-effective intervention to get things done. And surprisingly, while everybody is going around saying you need to build an integrated management information system of which everything about this person has to be in that same one record, you know that in England. Well, in fact, what they have found is low-tech coordination is actually more effective, meaning picking up the phone sending a fax. Another thing that they have found is what the world is now promoting, telemedicine, e-health, m-health for the elderly people, that's actually less effective than the personal appearance of someone showing up. So these are some of the lessons to be drawn from. And of course, each Asian country would have to do it according to what is available for them. So then the question is, how do you finance this package of integrated service? We have already said that out of pocket is associated, out of pocket spending is associated with inequitable care and also and also financial uh, high financial burden. So you don't want an age an elderly population to be paying for for, for this package of service directly from out of pocket. I hope I have convinced you that for many Asian countries, it would not be quite feasible for the government to pick up that new expenses. So it's a no-brainer. It has to be some sort of mixed financing. So where should the government money be targeting? And I think many countries from hearing it this morning is Many countries are already building programs that target the poor, the low income, and maybe even people in living in remote areas. But many non-poor are actually facing major financial burden to pay for elderly care. So somehow something needs to be done for the entire population. And so the lesson from the non-LTC, non-long-term care sectors uh, service pro uh, uh, provision is the most equitable way to finance is to have the government money targeting the poor and maybe even targeting a 
very limited basic benefit package for long for integrate for, for among this set of integrated surface delivery, uh, surface, and then have other individuals pay a contribution. It's a little bit like a social insurance, and all the money will be put into a single risk pool, so there is risk share, sharing, and everybody within that risk pool would have identical basic benefit. And if it is a country that you think you can tolerate, multi-tier system, you can also allow those who pay to actually buy into a more generous integrated delivery package. It's up to you to decide. Now the question is, I said that those who can afford to pay should then pay themselves. So the question is, should it be the current working population paying for these elder care? Or should it be the older people paying? Or what? I think we would have two presentations that would, from Korea and from Japan that talks about how they finance this. But an option that would be interesting to explore is actually a combination of what, what Singapore does. Not for its long-term care, though, and what social insurance is doing. Perhaps you can explore setting up mandatory savings. But the savings is not at an early age. But the saving is not like in Singapore to be drawn out to pay for medical care. You save it, and then when you're at 65 years old, you use it to contribute into an increased benefit package of long-term care integrated with your social insurance. And with this pooled budget, the question is, how do you incentivize the delivery system to do, deliver, to, to do integrated care? I think in both Suman's presentation and a little bit in John's presentation, you alluded to how your long-term care providers and your medical care providers actually have conflicting incentives. They don't want to work with each other. And this is a very important lesson that in order to incentivize your multiple providers who are in different settings to work together, you need to actually pay them either a capitated budget, choosing one of the provider as the primary contractor, and let this primary contractor bear the risk of providing integrated care and let this primary care contractor coordinate service with the other providers. The payer should not be the one doing it. Another possibility is instead of paying a capitated budget, you can pay what in the United States is trying to experiment, is bundled payment. Again, you don't pay a facility by facility. You pay for a package of service that is needed for a person for a certain episode of care, and the care has to be delivered crossing platforms of facilities. If it is not clear, we can discuss this further. So I have laid out in a very simple terms and probably more idealistic terms of in order to respond to an aging population, how a healthcare system needs to evolve. As I discuss, you will realize that all the changes that need to be done will take a long, long time. So to reinforce what a partner said in an earlier presentation, for countries that have not been hit by aging yet, it's actually not too early to start planning now. In order to save enough for your old age, in order to change your delivery system from your current hospital base to a primary care social based delivery system. All these change takes time. And I think the several take home message that I want you to, if I can, get you to remember is number one, when we think about a healthcare system, we should never start with thinking about how much money we should finance. We should always start with thinking about what is the need of your population and therefore the service delivery and therefore how you finance for it. Number two is, as population ages, the need for integrated care increases. I think many countries have found that it is actually very difficult to build primary health care 
it is very difficult to train what we call case manager because within the entire medical care system, they are looked upon as the inferior people. It takes a long, ta long time to change that culture, to change that professional norms in order to build that cadre. So you should start now. And fragmented financing exacerbates by that fragmented delivery system. And this is the one point I would raise to Korea and Japan is, is it the best option to separate long-term care financing from the rest of the financing? Does it actually inhibit you to try to change your delivery system? So that's all I have. Thank you. When no one asked question, I said, does everybody understand and agree with me everything? Or did I confuse everybody so much that you don't even know where you want to ask my question? Yes. Um, about this distinction between social, where does social care end and where does health care properly start? I am, I, I, those are definitely blurred boundaries. but. Uh, uh, some countries in the region, Thailand, China, and others are, are developing, to my understanding, policies and are funding and developing strategies on, on social care at community level, linked in a way to, to health care, but uh, still separate. No? I, I know this is a, a growing, this is a debate in the UK, for example, it was integrated, now there, there is a huge movement to separate them, to separate social care from community care. Basically, social care dealing with uh, supporting activities of daily life, IDEL, and, and, uh, and the, the issue of isolation that is becoming a major social concern. No? So can you elaborate more? Why do you say that they, they have to be integ integrated? No? So, uh, so I think this is an a, a, a important point that uh, I'm glad you asked it because I should have uh, clarified it. And in fact, this has, um, I think this is, uh, point number one is, you know, this idea of what is social care, what is health care, what is long-term care, at a certain point, there are a lot of blurred boundaries. You actually can't draw those lines so clearly. But I think what is important to think about is not so much whether medical care and social care is separate in terms of structure. I think in the UK the debate is about structure in terms of separating social care and GP. But I think what we're here talking about is integrating the functions, right? Because actually in different countries, some of the functions of social care is actually provided by the primary health care provider. So the important point is about what are the functions that are being done. And I can tell you that in China, on paper, the community health center is supposed to be doing some of the social care, like we have home visit or whatever, whatever. But are they doing it? <coughs> That's a slightly different question. Um, just to continue on the um, on the separation. So it is in many other countries, right? And for, for the reasons that it's the social content, the sort of the content of care where you know where people live bathing and, and you know, shopping, maybe some cooking, things like this is much more uh, 
uh, intense and also cheaper than anything that the medical profession would provide. So uh, I, I understand uh, what you're saying about the integrated uh, medical case management. So uh, I'm actually even wondering whether you need two whether you need somebody who would measure the medical needs of an aging individual. And you also need somebody who would um, Absolutely. put together that Absolutely. with the other social aspects, which could be done by person with much less communication. Absolutely. So what I was talking about this case manager is not just looking at the medical physical. I can't find. It's also about the other social needs, the functioning needs, including like this morning or the psychological counseling needs is in one package. It's, it's, a very, it's a very idealized system, but I was trying to propose something which is a direction that countries should move towards rather than they can jump ahead. But the point that you make about um, the separation of the ministry, it is a problem. Because quite often they don't coordinate their policy. Now, um, sometimes, at least in China, I think a lot of these um, social care that we were talking about from the Ministry of Civil Affairs, they're targeting certain companies. So then the question is, I think that it is not a problem for low-income people. It's a problem that is affecting old people at all income level. So the question is, to what extent you need to deal with Well, which is what I think Japan and Korea has. So, um, right. Sorry, can I just have a show of hands? How many of you, there, there, there's so many hands, but we're really running out of time. One, two, three, four, five. All Why right. don't we take questions and, and then I collect them? Why don't we take questions and then she will answer all of you at once and then we're <laughs> All right, so let's start from this side and then we'll come around. The one that I want to ask you. <laughs> My question is still related. Europe 
about this. I'm, I'm just wondering, do, do you know what the Taiwanese have done and how close is what they've done to what you're advocating? Okay, and then there's another question. Yes, okay. uh, My question is uh, just clarification. Uh, as a dissertation, in your dissertation, there are some messages that uh, are not online. On a dissertation, we never coordinate. <laughs> no <laughs> interview. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, one argument that Hannah says is that uh, means testing is, uh, is, is, is not necessary. And uh, you uh, propose that the government manage to target the poor, and the, uh, those who can pay should pay the contribution. So maybe some clarification on the country's problems. Is it a last question that I asked? Yes. So I think that a meeting with reinsurance, but we're not by reinsurance. Sense that people, the, the concerns that were very lucky to provide health care insurance because all of the parents are just too unknown. And so, when I mean, your model of you know, having this, have mandatory saving and then get an age and they're going to buy premiums, are you thinking that they're going to get premiums for private insurance or is all just the government and social insurance kind of set out? Right. So, let me answer the last question at that point. Um, uh, which why I would also answer the question uh, earlier is this idea of having people save at an earlier age and then at a certain age draw out the money to finance or long-term pensions. Uh, I haven't graduated in 1995, so I didn't attend the Taiwan conference. <laughs> but uh, they haven't done that, and I think Rachel later on will tell you a little bit what Taiwan is doing. I think they're doing a bit similar to what is doing. What, uh, what I, half of what I said was what we proposed for Hong Kong in 1999. They did not take it out for that reason. It's the long term, the insurance company find it, there's so little data for them to predict what is a long term care insurance policy that would make it viable for them. What I'm saying today is actually different from what we proposed in Hong Kong earlier is because I think that if you have people save and then at 65 years old buy, take out a privately based long-term care insurance plan, even if private insurance is willing to provide that product, it still does not solve that problem of fragmentation. You still have like 10 companies having their different policies, paying the provider differently, and I think this is where United States was facing or the, the medical care system. I was thinking about it's a hybrid of that and perhaps what Korea and Japan is doing. It's still a social health insurance scheme to finance this long term care. But you do need additional money for this older group of people for this additional services. And so people then take their savings to then pay so it's a hybrid of social insurance at the age of 65 with savings early. So on cost effects, cost savings, I don't have any concrete numbers, but from the European analysis is they have been able to demonstrate this integrated delivery system was able to reduce emergency care use, hospitalization significantly, and um, I don't have the detail, but I can share you that report. Now on this, uh, I don't think I'm saying anything which is different from a partner in terms of means testing. I, I'm just saying that government has limited money, so who should they pay for? They should pay for the poor people. And sometimes targeting the poor means doing a means testing, but sometimes targeting the poor means doing something much cooler, including based on location, based on some category that we don't do means testing. We know there is leakage, but there's a trade-off between leakage and the administrative cost to do 100% perfect uh, uh, means testing. And on the question of long-term, separating long-term care and health care versus integrating them, it is something worth taking out to discuss and debate. My sense is there's no single answer for every country. You would have to, be, you would have to take advantage of the opportunity. If we can start from scratch, there's no constraint, no institution history, I would say integrating is better. 
because if you don't integrate it, it's very hard to integrate your delivery system. When you have different providers paid by different sources of financing, that always is a conflict of interest. However, we are faced with many institutions that we cannot get rid of. So, and, and uh, to, to quote um, our Deng Xiaoping from Manchester, I think Asia is really is, uh, the place for experimentation, but I would say experimentation for the sake of learning lessons needs to be properly planned. Asia has a lot of experimentation for the purpose of experimentation, and they roll out with no evidence. Sorry, it's my two, two cents. I'm working too much in China. <laughs> Thank you very much, Winnie. Um, now